Part 1. The Human Body in Symbolism In Scripture, we are told that God made man in his own image. It is so stated not only in the Christian Bible, but also in the holy writings of nearly all enlightened people. The Jewish patriarchs taught that the human body was the microcosm, or little cosmos, made in the image of the macrocosm, or great cosmos. This analogy between the finite and the infinite is said to be one of the keys by the aid of which the secrets of the Holy Writ are unlocked. There is no doubt that the Old Testament is a psychological and anatomical textbook to those capable of reading it from a scientific viewpoint. The functions of the human body, the attributes of the human mind, and the qualities of the human soul have been personified by the wise women and men of the ancient world and a great drama has been built around the relationship to themselves and each other. To the great Egyptian demigod Hermes, the human race owes its concept of the law of analogy. The great hermetic axiom was, that which is above is like unto that which is below, and that which is below is like unto that which is above. The religions of the ancient world were all based upon nature worship, which in a denigrated form has survived to our own clay as phallicism. The worship of the parts and functions of the human body began in the later Lumerian period. During the Atlantean epoch, this religion gave place to sun worship, but the new faith incorporated many of the doctrines and rituals and symbols of the previous belief. The building of the temples in the form of the human body is a custom common to all peoples. The tabernacle of the Jews, the great Egyptian temple of Karnak, the religious structures of the Hawaiian priests, and the Christian churches laid out in the form of a cross are examples of this practice. If the human body were laid out with the arms spread in the shape of any of these buildings, it would be found that the high altar would occupy the same relative position in the building that the brain occupies in the human body. They recognized that all the functions of nature were reproduced in miniature in the human body. They therefore used man as the textbook, teaching their disciples that to understand man was to understand the universe. These wise ones believe that every star in the heavens, every element in earth, and every function in nature was represented by a corresponding center, pole, or activity within the human body. This correlation between nature without and the nature of man within, which was concealed from the multitudes, formed a secret teaching of the ancient priestcraft. Religion in Atlantis and Egypt was taken much more seriously than it is today. It was the very life of these peoples. The priests had complete control over millions of ignorant women and men who had been taught since childhood that these robed and bearded patriarchs were the direct messengers of God. And it was believed that any disobedience to the commands of the priests would bring down upon the offender's head the wrath of the Almighty. The temple depended for its maintenance upon the secret wisdom, which gave its priests control over certain powers of nature and made them vastly superior in wisdom and understanding to the laity whom they controlled. These wise ones realized that there was a great deal more involved in religion than the chanting of mantras and the singing of hymns. They realized that the path of salvation could be walked successfully only by those who had practical, scientific knowledge of the occult function of their own bodies. The anatomical symbolism, which they evolved in order to perpetuate this understanding, has come down to modern Christianity, but the keys to it apparently have been lost. It is a tragic situation for the religionists that they are surrounded by hundreds of symbols which they cannot understand, but it is still sadder that they have even forgotten that these symbols even had any meaning other than the foolish interpretations which they themselves have concocted. The idea prevalent in the minds of Christians that their faith is the one and only truly inspired doctrine and that it came parentless into the world is unreasonable to the extreme. Christianity, like the other Abrahamic religions, have begged, borrowed, and stolen their philosophies and concepts from the religions, philosophies, and spiritual practices of the ancient pagan worlds. Among the religious symbols and allegories which belonged to the world long ago before the coming of Christianity are a few to which we'd like to call your attention. The following Christian symbols and concepts are of pagan origin. The Christian cross comes from Egypt and India. The triple meter from the faith of the Mithriarchs the shepherd's crook from the Hermetic Mysteries and Greece, the Immaculate Conception from India, the Transfiguration from Persia, and the Trinity from the Brahmas. The Virgin Mary, as the Mother of God, is found in a dozen different faiths. There are over 20 crucified world saviors. 
The church steeple is an adaptation of Egyptian obelisks and pyramids, while the Christian devil is the Egyptian typhon with certain modifications. The deeper one goes into the problem, the more they realize that there is nothing new under the sun. Sincere study of Christian faith proves beyond all doubt that it is an evolutionary outgrowth of primitive doctrines. There is an evolution in religion as well as in physical form. If we accept and incorporate into our doctrines the religious symbology of nearly 40 peoples, it behooves us to understand the meaning of the myths and allegories which we borrow, lest we be more ignorant than those from who we secured them. This film is devoted to the problem of explaining the relationship existing between the symbolism of the ancient priests and the occult functions of the human body. We must first understand that all sacred writings are supposed to be sealed within seven seals. In other words, it requires seven complete interpretations to understand fully the meaning of these ancient philosophical revelations to which we have liked to call Holy Writ. Scripture is not intended to be historical. Those who understand its literal meaning understand the least of its meaning. It is well known that Shakespeare, for dramatic reasons, brought together, in his plays, characters who had actually lived hundreds of years apart. But Shakespeare was not writing history, he was penning drama. The same is true for the Bible. Scripture leaves historians hopelessly involved in self-contradictory chronological tables, where the majority of historians will remain until Judgment Day. Scripture furnishes excellent subject matter for debates, and also grounds for hair-splitting over the meanings and terms and provable locations of unknown cities. Many of the biblical landmarks now pointed out by guides were named hundreds of years after the birth of Christ by pilgrims who suspected them of occupying sites somewhere near those mentioned in the Bible. All of this may prove convincing by some, but to the thinker it is conclusive evidence that history is the least important part of holy books. When the Empress Helena, mother of Constantine the Great, visited Jerusalem in 320 AD, she discovered not only that all traces of Christianity had been lost, but that the temple dedicated to the goddess Venus stood on a hill now accepted as Mount Calvary. Less than 400 years after the death of Christ, there was apparently no one in the Holy Land who had ever heard of him. This does not necessarily imply that he never lived, but it certainly does indicate that the halos of miracles and supernatural atmosphere with which modern Christianity envelopes him, are largely mythological. Like all other religions, the Christian faith accumulated a weird collection of fantastic legends which are its own worst enemies. For they have taken the simple moralist of Nazareth, the man who loved his fellow creatures, and built around him a superstructure of idolatry which loves no one and serves only itself. As Buddha in India merely reformed the Brahmin concepts of his day, so Jesus reshaped the faith of Israel and gave to his disciples and the world a doctrine based upon that which had gone before, but remodeled it to meet the needs of the peoples who surrounded him and the problems which confronted the Jewish nation. The Essenes who educated Jesus were of Egyptian and Hindu origin, and his faith incorporated the best of that which had gone before. The records preserved of him are largely allegorical, and the simple man is plunged by them into a great sea of supernaturalism. This was not entirely without purpose, however, for as Shakespeare took license with his history in order to present essential truths, so it seems the historians of Jesus use the character of the man as a groundwork for a great drama. He becomes the hero of a seven-sealed story, and those Christians who have studied symbolism can gain from it that the story is the key to the true Christian mysteries. They may then realize that Scripture is perpetual history, that it pertains to no nation or people, but it is the story of all nations and all peoples. It is a wonderful thing, for example, to study the life of Christ in the light of astronomy, for he becomes the sun and his disciples the twelve signs of the zodiac. Among the constellations we find the scenes of his ministry, and in the procession of the equinoxes the story of his birth, growth, maturity, and death for men. We discover that the life of Christ, as found in the Gospels, have been conventionalized until it agrees perfectly with the lives of dozens of world saviors, for all of them are also astronomical and psychological myths. All of these myths come to us out of the most remote antiquity, where the primitive races used the human body as the symbolic unit, and the gods and demons were personified out of the origins and functions of the body. 
Among certain Kabbalistic writers, the Holy Land is mapped out in the human body, and the various sites are shown as the centers of consciousness in man. There is a wonderful study here for those who will investigate deeply and sincerely the ancient mysteries. We cannot hope to cover all the ground, but if you can gain from this film a key to the situation, we hope you will pursue the line of thought until you have made it all-inclusive and open to at least one seal of the Book of Divine Revelation. According to the mystery schools, the human body is divided into three major parts, and in analogy with this, the universe without is said to be composed of three worlds, heaven, earth, and hell. Heaven is the superior world and is thought to be above. Nearly all religions teach that God dwells in the heavens. Their members are taught to believe that God is above them, so they raise their hands in prayer and lift their eyes to the heavens when they implore or petition him. Among some nations he is supposed to dwell in the tops of mountains, which are the highest places in the world. Between heaven above and hell beneath is the earth which the Scandinavians call Midgard, or the Middle Garden. It is suspended in space and forms the dwelling place of men and other living creatures. Connected to the heavens by a rainbow bridge down which the gods descend, its volcanic craters and fissures are said to connect it with hell, the land of darkness and oblivion. Here, Twixt heaven and earth dominion wielding exists nature. The green grass, the flowing rivers, the mighty ocean, exist only in the middle world, which is a sort of neutral ground where the hosts of good and evil fight their eternal battle of Armageddon. Below, in darkness and flames, torment and suffering, is the world of hell. It is a great beneath, for as surely as we think of heaven as up, we think of hell as down, where this middle place, earth, seems to be the dividing line between them. In hell are forces of evil, destroying powers which are always bringing sorrow to the earth and which struggle untearingly to overthrow the throne of the gods in heaven. The entire system is an anatomical myth. For the heaven world of the ancients, the dome temple on the top of the mountain, was the skull with its divine contents. It is termed up because it occupies the northern end of the human spine. The temple of the gods who rule the earth is said to be the North Pole, because the North Pole represents the positive end of the spinal column of the planetary lord. The Hindus symbolize the spine as the stem of the sacred lotus. Therefore, the skull and contents are symbolized by the flower. The spinal column is Jacob's ladder connecting the heavens and the earth, while its 33 segments are the degrees of masonry and the number of years of the life of Christ. Up these segments... The candidate ascends in consciousness to reach the Temple of Initiation located on top of the mountain. It is in this domed room with a hole in the floor, foramen magnum, that the great mystery initiations are given. The Himalayan mountains rise above the earth, representing the shoulders and upper half of the body. They are the highest mountains in the world. Somewhere upon their summit stands the temple, resting, like the heavens of the Greeks, upon the shoulders of Atlas. Atlas is the upper vertebrae of the human spine upon which the condyles of the skull rest. In the brain there are a number of caves, ventricles, and folds, and in them, according to Eastern legend, live the wise men, the yogis and hermites. The cave of the yogis are said to be located at the head of the Ganges River. Every religion has its sacred river. To the Christians it is the Jordan, to the Egyptians it is the Nile, while to the Hindus it is the Ganges. This sacred river is the spinal canal, which has its source among the peaks of the mountains. The holy men in their retreats represent the spiritual sight of the human brain and are the seven sleepers of the Quran, who must remain in the darkness of their caves until the spirit revitalizes them. The brain is the upper room referred to in the Gospels where Jesus met with his disciples, and it is said that the disciples themselves represent the twelve convolutions of the brain. It is these twelve convolutions which later send their messages by means of the nerves into the body below to preach the Gospels of Middle Earth. These twelve convolutions gather around the central opening in the brain, the third ventricle, which is the Holy of Holies, the mercy seat, where between the spreading wings of the angels, Jehovah talks with the high priest, and where both day and night and Shekinah's glory hovers. From this point, also, the spirit finally ascends from Golgotha, the place in the skull. It is a clairvoyant fact that the spirit not only leaves, but also enters the body through the crown of the head. 
The Trinity in man lives in three great chambers of the human body, from which they radiate their power through the three worlds. These centers are the brain, the heart, and the reproductive system. These are the three main chambers of the pyramid and also the room in which Ark given the entered apprentice, fellow craft, and master mason's degree of the Blue Lodge masonry. In these three chambers dwell the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, who are symbolized by the three-letter word, Eum. The transmutation, regeneration, and unfoldment of these three great centers result in the sounding of the lost word, which is the great secret of the Masonic order. From the spinal nerves comes impulses and life forces which make this possible. Therefore, the mason is told to consider carefully his substitute word, which means the marrow of the bone. In the cerebellum, or posterior brain, which has charge of the motion system of the human body and is the only brain developed in the animal, is to be found a little tree-like growth which has long been symbolized by a sprig of acacia and as such is referred to in the Masonic allegory. The two lobes of the cerebellum were called by the ancients Cain and Abel, and to have much to do with the legend of the curse of Cain, which is literally the curse of unbalance. For the murder of the spirit of equilibrium, Cain is sent forth a wanderer upon the face of the earth. The right half of the brain is under the control of Mercury, the planet of intelligence, and as a result of the crossing of the brain nerves and the base of the skull, it rules the left side of the body. The left half of the brain, under the control of Mars, the spirit of anger and impulse, rules the right side of the body and likewise the strong right arm. As the result of hatred and the rulership of Mars which grows out of hatred, the left rear side of the brain can be twice the size of the right side if the individual allows Mars to control his nature. The impetuosity of Mars can rule and pay for the life with the mark of Cain. Science knows that there is a very narrow line between genius and insanity. For any dominating vice or virtue man must pay with imbalance. Unbalance always distorts the viewpoint, and distorted viewpoints are unfailingly productive of misery. In the skull is the switchboard which controls the activities of the body. Every function of man below the neck is controlled by a center of consciousness in the brain. Proof of this is fact that the injury of certain centers of the brain result in paralysis of various parts of the body. Medical science now knows that the spinal cord is an elongation of the brain, and some authorities even claim the cord to be capable of intelligence throughout its entire life. This cord is the flaming sword which is supposed to have stood at the gates of the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden is the skull, within which is a tree bearing twelve manner of fruit. The brain is filled with valued chambers and passageways which have their correspondence in the spans and arches of the temples, while the third ventricle is undoubtedly the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid. The spinal cord is the serpent of the ancients. In Central and South America, the savior god is called Quetzalcoatl. His name means the feathered serpent, and this has always been his symbol. This is the brazen serpent raised by Moses in the wilderness. The nine rattles on the tail of the serpent are called the number of man, and they represent the sacral and coccygeal bones with whose centers the secret of human evolution is contained. Every organ of the physical body is reproduced by the brain, where it can be traced back to the law of analogy. There are two embryonic human forms, one female and the other male, twisted together in the brain. These are the yin and the yang of China, the black and white dragons biting each other. One of these figures has, at its origin, of expression the pineal gland, and the other is the pituitary gland. These two ductless glands are well worth consideration, for they are very important factors in the unfolding of human consciousness. It is known that these glands are larger and more active in higher grades of mentality than those in lower quality. These two little glands are called the head and the tail of the dragon of wisdom. They are the copper and zinc poles of an electric circuit which has the entire body as a battery. The pituitary body is the feminine pole, or negative center, which has charge of the expressions of physical energy. Its activity also regulates to a large degree the size and weight of the body. It is also a thermometer, revealing disorder in any of the other chain of ductless glands. The pituitary body is known under the following symbols by the ancient world. The alchemical retort, the mouth of the dragon, the Virgin Mary, the Holy Grail, the lunar crescent, the laver of purification, 
one of the cherubim of the arch, the Isis of Egypt, the Radha of India, and the fish's mouth. It may well be called the hope of glory of physical man. At the opposite end of the third ventricle is the pineal gland, which looks not unlike a pine cone, from which it secures its name. Sir Ernest Alfred Wallace Budge, keeper of the Egyptian antiquities in the British Museum, mentions in one of his works the Egyptian custom of tying pine cones to the tops of their heads. These are fastened to the tops of the heads of the dead when taken into the presence of Osiris, lord of the underworld. Undoubtedly, this symbol referred to the pineal gland. It was also a custom to certain African tribes to fasten pieces of fat to the tops of their heads and allow them to melt in the sun and run down over them as part of their religious observances. It is interesting that the Native Americans should wear their feather, which is originally symbolic of spiritual perception, in the same place where the Christian monk shaves his head. The Hindus teach that the pineal gland is the third eye, called the eye of Dangma. It is called by the Buddhists the all-seeing eye, and spoken of in Christianity as the eye single. We are told that ages ago, the pineal gland was the organ of sense orientation by which man cognized the spiritual world, but that with the coming of the material senses and the two objective eyes, it ceased to be used, and during the time of the Lumerian race retreated to its present position in the brain. It is said that children, recapitulating their previous periods of evolution, have a limited use of the third eye up to their seventh year, at which time the skull bones grow together. This accounts for the semi-clairvoyant condition of children, who are far more sensitive than adults along psychic lines. The pineal gland is supposed to secrete an oil, which is called resin, the life of the pine tree. This word is said to be involved with the origin of the Rosicrucians, who were working with the secretions of the pineal gland and seeking to open the eye single. For it is said in Scripture, The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be filled with light. The pineal gland is the tail of the dragon and has a tiny, finger-like protuberance at one end. This gland is called Joseph, for it is the father and the God-man. The finger-like protuberance is called the staff of God, sometimes the holy spear. Its shape is like the evaporating vessel of the alchemists. It is a spiritual organ which is later destined to be what it once was, namely a connecting link between the human and the divine. The vibrating finger on the one end of this gland is the rod of Jesse and the scripture of the high priest. Certain exercises, as given in the Eastern and Western mystery schools, cause this little finger to vibrate, resulting in a buzzing, droning sound in the brain. This is sometimes very distressing, especially when the individual who experiences this phenomenon, in all too many cases, knows nothing about the experience through which they are passing. In the middle of the brain and surrounded by the convolutions is the third ventricle, a vaulted chamber of initiation. Around it sit three kings, three great centers of life and power, the pituitary gland, the pineal gland, and the optic thalamus. In this chamber also is a small gritty seed, which is undoubtedly connected to the king's coffer in the Great Pyramid. The third ventricle is supposed to be the seat of the soul, and the aura radiating from the heads of saints and sages is said to represent the golden glow pouring from this third ventricle. Between the eyes and just above the root of the nose is a spreading in the front bone of the skull, which is called the frontal sinus. The slight bulge caused by the spreading of this bone is known to phrenology as the seat of individuality. It is here that the jewels are placed on the foreheads of the Buddhas, and it is also from this point that the serpent rose from the crown of the ancient Egyptians. Several of the mystery schools teach that there is a seat of Jehovah in the human body. While his function is through the generative system, his center of consciousness as part of the spirit of man is supposed to be located in the sea of blue ether called the Veil of Isis in the center of the frontal sinus. When clairvoyantly studying the body of man, that little point shows up as a black dot and cannot be analyzed. The Palatine Hill of the Ancients, upon which were built the temples of Jupiter and Juno, also has its place in the human body. The palate bone is also sort of a hill-shaped structure, and right above it are the orbital cavities containing the two eyes, which are the Jupiter and Juno of the ancient world. The cross, of course, represents the human body. The upper limb of it is the head of the man rising above the horizontal line of his outstretched arms. 
As already stated, the great churches and cathedrals of the world have been built in the form of a cross, and contain, where the head should be, the altar upon which are burning lighted candles. These candles are symbolic of spiritual sense centers in the brain. While the custom of placing a rose window over the altar suggests a soft place in the top of the skull. The skull, the upper room, is the sanctum sectorum of the Masonic temple, and to it only the pure can aspire. The winged bone, which medical science knows as the sphenoid, is the Egyptian scarab carrying in its claws the pituitary body and also bearing aloft the gleaming spark of immortality located in the frontal sinus. We are told in ancient mythologies that the gods came down from heaven and walked with man, instructing them in the arts and sciences. In a similar way, the godlike powers of mankind descend from the heaven world of his brain to carry on the work of constructing and reconstructing natural substances. We are told that the ultimate of the evolution of man's body will slowly be dissolved back again into the brain, which was its origin, until nothing remains but seven globular centers radiating seven perfect sense perceptions, which are the spirits before the throne and the saviors which he is bringing into the world to redeem it through the seven periods of his growth. Mankind is an inverted planet, gaining his nourishment from the sun as the plant does from the earth. As the life of a plant ascends, it stems to nourish its leaves and branches, so the life of man, rooted in the brain, descends to produce the same result. This life descending is symbolized in the world's saviors who come down into the world and die for men. Later these lives are returned again to the brain, where they glorify man before all the worlds of creation. So much for the story of the brain. Now let us consider the next of mankind's marvelous parts, namely the spinal column. Connecting the two worlds, heaven above and the sphere of darkness below, is a spinal column, a chain of 33 segments protecting within them the spinal cord. This ladder of bones plays a very important part in the religious symbolism of the ancients. It is often referred to as a winding road or stairway. Sometimes it is called the serpent, at other times the wand or scepter. The Hindus teach that there are three distinct canals or tubes in the spinal system. They call them Ida, Pingula, and Shishamna. These tubes connect the lower generative centers of the body with the brain. The Greeks symbolize them by the caduceus, or winged staff of Hermes. This consisted of a long rod, which ended in a knob or ball on the medulla oblongata. On each side of this knob are wings arched over, used to represent the two lobes of the cerebellum. Up this staff and twisted around it with two serpents, one black and one white. These represent Ida and Pingula. The ancient Hindus have a legend concerning the goddess Kundalini, in which it is said that she descended by means of a ladder or cord from heaven to a little island floating in the great sea. Connecting this with embryology, it is evident that the ladder or cord represents the umbilical cord, while the little island is the solar plexus. When the ladder is cut away from the heavens, the goddess flees in terror to the cave, sacral plexus, where she hides from the sight of men. Like Amaterasu, the Japanese goddess, she must be lured from her cave, for while she is there and refuses to come forth, the world is in darkness. Kundalini is a Sanskrit word meaning a serpentine or twisting gas or force. This force, so the Eastern sages claim, can be drawn up through the central spinal canal, the Shashumna. When this essence strikes the brain, it opens up the center of spiritual consciousness and inner perception, bringing with it spiritual illumination. The system whereby this is made possible is the most secret teaching of the Eastern saints, for they realize that this spiral, twisting force, not only is illuminating, but like the serpent which is its symbol, also a deadly poison. Smatterings of Eastern occultism can be found in the Western world, but sometimes bringing suffering and sorrow. For these great truths in the hands of individuals incapable of rightly understanding or applying them destroy intelligence and reason. Along the spine are a number of nerve ganglia and plexuses, all of them have their place in religious symbolism. For example, we are told that the early Jews called the sacred plexus and the sacred cosigial ganglion 
the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. There is a small plexus in the region of the kidneys called the Sagittarial Plexus, which the ancients knew as the city of Tarsus, where St. Paul fought the beasts. Higher occultism teaches that the lotus blossoms, nerve centers of the spine, are reflections of negative poles bearing witness to the seven great positive centers of consciousness located in the brain. These seven function through the centers of the spine in approximately the same way that the seven spirits before the throne functions through the planetary bodies. The disciple is warned not to work with the centers upon the spine, but to labor instead with their true rulers, the centers in the brain. The wanderings of the children of Israel in the wilderness, the pilgrimage of the Mohammedan to Mecca, the endless pilgrims of the Hindu holy men who spend their lives going from one shrine to another, represent the pilgrimage of the spirit fire, kundalini, through the nerve centers along the spine. By certain specifications, force is turned into these centers one after the other, until, when seen clairvoyantly, they are great, flower-like areas from which light rays stem like petals. Each of these lotus blossoms has a different number of petals according to the number of nerves which branch out from it. It is said that the Logos, when the time came to create the material universe, entered a state of deep meditation. Gradually, the life force descended from the brain, which was the great superior world, and striking these flowers one after the other wave birth to the lower worlds. When at last the spirit fire struck the lowest center, the physical world was created, and that fire was the base of the spine. When the world returns again, it becomes superior in consciousness because the withdrawal from the life force of these seven centers, beginning with the lowest and returning again to the brain. Thus, the path of evolution for all living things is to raise this fire, whose descent made their manifestation in these lower worlds possible, and whose raising brings them into harmony once more with the superior worlds. This myth of the life force that came down and took upon itself worlds is found amongst all civilized nations on earth. This is the harem Abif who built the Masonic Temple, and was then slain by the three vehicles which he formed. This is likewise the Christ, slain for the sins of the world. Because of the fact that the spinal fire is a twisting, serpentine force, the snake has been used in all parts of the world to represent the world's saviors. The headpiece worn by the Egyptian priests upon their foreheads was symbolic of Kundalini, the sacred cobra who, when she was raised in the wilderness, saved all who gazed upon her. As the brain is the center of the divine world, so the solar plexus is the center of the human world. For representing semi-consciousness, it links the unconscious below with the consciousness above. Mankind is not only capable of thinking through their brain, they are capable of a certain phase of thought through the nerve centers of the solar plexus. To the average person, there is no difference between a medium and a clairvoyant. But to the mystic, these two phases of spiritual sight are separated by an entire span of human evolution. A clairvoyant is one who has raised the spinal serpent into the brain and by her or his growth earned the right of perceiving the invisible worlds with the aid of the third eye or pineal gland. This organ of consciousness, which millions of years ago connected mankind with the invisible worlds, closed during the Lumerian period when the objective senses began to develop. The occultist, however, by the process of developing, hinted before, may reopen this eye and by the means of it explore invisible worlds. Clairvoyants are not born, they are made. Mediums are not made, they are born. The clairvoyant can become such only after years, sometimes lives, of self-preparation. On the other hand, the medium, by sitting in a darkened room or by the other similar practices, may secure results in mere days. The medium uses the solar plexus as a mirror, and upon it, sensitive nerves are reflected pictures recorded in the invisible ethers. Through the spleen, which is the gateway to the etheric body, the medium permits decarnated intelligence to come into their spiritual constitution, the result being voices and other spirit manifestations. Automatic writing is gained by permitting the etheric arm of an outside intelligence to control temporarily the physical arm of the medium. This is not possible until the medium removes their etheric double from the arm, for two things cannot occupy the same place at the same time. The process of periodically separating the life force from the physical arm is very dangerous, often resulting in paralysis. Mediumship is unnatural to mankind. 
while clairvoyance is the natural result of growth and the unfolding of the spiritual nature. There are a hundred mediums to one clairvoyant, for the clairvoyant can become only such through self-mastery and the exertion of tremendous power, while the weaker, the more sickly, and the more nervous an individual is, the better of a medium they make. The clairvoyant is unfolding their mind by filling it with useful knowledge, while the first instruction given to the would-be medium is, make your mind a blank. The reason mediumship through the solar plexus is a retrogression may be summed up as follows. The group of spirits who control the destinies of the animal kingdoms govern, then charge through pictures thrown against the solar plexus, for the animal has no self-conscious mind. As a result, instead of thinking with its own brain, it thinks with the brain of the group spirit to whom it is attached by invisible magnetic cords. These cords convey their impressions and photograph them upon the sympathetic nervous system. Having no will of its own, the animal is incapable of combating these urges and consequently obeys them implicitly. Mankind governs itself through the cerebrospinal nervous system because he has developed individuality and the sympathetic system no longer rules him. Opening themselves to the impulses through the solar plexus area, the medium is thwarting their own growth by preventing the cerebrospinal nervous system from controlling their destiny. Mankind has always liked to lean on external things. They hate to face each problem and solve it with the brain God gave them. They consequently lean on the invisible worlds, asking for help to accomplish the labors which they should do on their own efforts. Thousands of people must carry the karmic responsibilities of the medium. For many follow this calling because thousands or millions of others want to talk to deceased relatives or get inside tips on the stock exchange. Those who buy their patronage encourage things of which they do not themselves approve, are personally responsible for this injury which their selfishness has thus permitted other persons to inflict upon themselves. The difference, therefore, between mediumship and clairvoyance is about half the length of the spinal column. It is the difference between the negative and the positive. It is the difference between the midnight of the seance room and the noonday of the temple. All of the organs within the body of man have their religious significance. The heart with its chambers is itself a temple standing upon the mountain of the diaphragm. It is this etheric body coiled within the spleen that injects the white blood corpuscles into the circulatory system. The human body has been the inspiration for nearly all mechanical contrivances. Hinges are copied from the human body, likewise die ball and socket joints. The first plumbing was reproduced from the arterial and venous circulatory systems. Hundreds of machines and implements have been inspired by the subtle workings of our own vehicles, for the human body is the most marvelously constructed machine that the human mind can study. The close relationship between the generative system below and the brain above is, of course, due to the spine connecting them. At a certain time, the number of little doors that now separate the brain from the generative system are opened, and the shishumna becomes an open tunnel so that every impulse is carried immediately to both ends of the body. It is for this reason that the candidate assumes the vows of celibacy, for to close the connection existing between the advanced disciple between the brain and the reproductive system necessitates an absolute conservation of all life energies. The tonsils are directly connected with the generative system. In fact, they are part of its own positive pull in the brain. The customs of vaccinating healthy children and cutting out normal tonsils on general principles should be reconsidered. Most tonsils are infected as the result of child eating too many sweets during the first years of life. The moral is, don't cut out the tonsils, cut out the sweets. Many parents are responsible for the illness of their children. Through either ignorance or indulgence as they allow the infantile consciousness, as yet uncontrolled by its higher vehicles, to destroy itself before life fairly begins. When children are sick during the early years of life, the physician will often find the cause of alignment in the parent, and the father or mother, not the child, should be treated. If the stomach is kept in proper condition, the tonsils will give very little trouble. The absolute economy exhibited by nature in the building of all its structures should be sufficient proof that the Creator was not wasting time when they made tonsils or foreskins or appendices. They apparently had good reason for making them. But these offending organs have become a gold mine to medical industry who remove them at the slightest provocation. We are told that the vertical position assumed by the human body 
which forces the contents of the intestinal tract to travel part of the time uphill, is the reason for the appendix, which is missing in creatures of horizontal carriage. Every organ not only has its visible purpose, but also its invisible spiritual purpose, and the individual who manages to go through life preserving intact as many as possible of their original anatomical parts and members is to be admired. While on the subject of the debt of science to the human body, we might add that the decimal system is the result of primitive man's counting on his fingers, whereby ten became the unit of enumeration. The ancient cubit also was the distance between the elbow and the end of the second finger. We find that nearly everything with which mankind has surrounded themselves is an adaptation from the body with which source surrounded their spirit. Mankind is gradually gaining control, not only over the organs of their body, but also their functions. Science states that certain organs function anatomically and mechanically, but occultism realizes that there is nothing mechanical about the functions of the human body. Let us take as an example the workman throwing a piece of iron among the wheels and levers of a smoothly working machine. There is a grinding crash, and the machine stops. If, for example, you introduce a foreign element somewhere into the body, it will immediately begin the process of sending it back out. It will surround the element with a coating and try and absorb it. If this is impossible, it will try and eject it through some channel appointed for that purpose. If this means fails, it will, in many cases, accustom itself to the preservance of the obstacle and keep right working away. This shows unmistakably that the organic parts of mankind possess inherent forms of intelligence. Therefore, they are not machines, for no mechanical device is capable of intelligence. Paracelsus, the great Swiss physician, whom after many years in the Far East returned to Switzerland to teach medicine, first gave to the European world its concept of the nature spirits. He taught that the functions of nature were under the control of little creatures who were invisible to the normal senses, but whom, working through the kingdoms of life, minerals, plants, animals, and parts of the human body, kept all of these evolving in an intelligent way. Under the control of the great celestial hierarchy of Scorpio, which has charge of all bodybuilding in nature, these elements are the invisible intelligences governing the human body and its functions. As the result of mankind's ever-evolving consciousness— they are acquiring more complete control over the functions of their various organs. There are two kinds of muscles, voluntary and involuntary, the difference being that the voluntary muscles, which are controlled by the conscious mind of the individual, have fibers running two ways and crossing each other, while those which are involuntary are without cross fibers. The heart used to be considered an involuntary muscle, but it is now beginning to show cross fibers thus foreshadowing the day when mankind will consciously and intelligently regulate the beating of their own heart. The same will be true with respect to all other organs that survive the periodic changes taking place in the constitution of mankind. The Eastern Holy Ones can successfully live without their heart beating and can stop it or start it at will. By lifting the tongue so that it closes the air passage into the lungs, they can remain in suspended animation for months. Many Eastern disciples do this while giving spiritual initiations out of the physical body. There are cases on record where these holy ones have been buried in the ground. Weeks later, when the body is dug up, it is found to be dried like leather. Water was poured onto it, and after a certain lapse of time, the man who had not taken a breath in weeks got up and walked off. This is an example of the result of an extraordinary control in which the mind is capable of gaining over the functions of the body. Occultism teaches that there is an entire universe within the human body, that it has its worlds, its planes, and its gods and goddesses. Millions of minute cells are its inhabitors. These tiny creatures are grouped together into kingdoms, nations, and races, and become one thing composed of many parts. The supreme ruler and god of this great world is the consciousness in mankind which says, I am. This consciousness picks up its universe and moves to another town. Every time it walks up and down the street, it takes hundreds of millions of solar systems with it. But because they are so infinitesimal, mankind cannot realize that they are actually worlds. In like manner, we are actually individual cells in the body of an infinite creation, which is hurling itself through infinity at an unknown speed. Suns, moons, and stars are merely bones in a great skeleton composed of all substances of the universe. 
Our own little lives are merely parts of that infinite life throbbing and coursing through the arteries of the veins of space. But all this is so vast as to be beyond the comprehension of this little I am in us. Therefore, we may say that both extremes are equally incomprehensible. We live in a middle world between infinite greatness on the one hand and infinite smallness on the other. As we grow, our world grows also, resulting in a corresponding increase in the scope of our understanding of all of these wonders. Part 4. The Infernal Worlds At the base of the spine is located the throne of the Lord of Form, commonly called Jehovah and Shiva. The linga is his symbol. He rides the great bull of earthiness. His daughter is death and destruction, yet he is not a thing of evil. He builds the bodies which give us power to function in the lower worlds. He crystallizes them around lines of force. Geometry is the skeleton, and all the bodies which he builds are geometric problems, geometric angles crystallized into rocks and stones. Gradually, the crystallization which brings bodies into the world causes them to become too dense and unyielding to respond to the subtle impressions from the spiritual consciousness. Slowly they turn to stone, and death is the result of the same cause that brought the body into the world. The early races of the earth worshipped the procreative attributes of life. They felt that the highest expression of life was the power of giving still another life to the world. Therefore, the principle of life-giving was personified into a deity who gave life to all things, or rather brought into manifestation the latent life which cannot grow or unfold into the physical world without the vehicle of dense substance. To the occultist, birth is death, and death is awakening. The mystics of ancient days taught that to be born into a physical world was to enter a tomb, for no other plane of nature is so unresponsive, so limited as the earth world. Time and distance were prison bars chaining the soul to narrow environments. Heat and cold tormented the soul, age deprived it of its faculties, and man's life was but a preparation for death. As life is lived under the shadow of death, they taught that this is a mockery, a hollow thing, gilded to the careless eye, but tarnished and worm-eaten upon close examination. The physical body became the specular, the tomb, the place of burial in which spirit lay awaiting the day of liberation, when as a virgin spark, when it should arise again from the broken urn of clay. Therefore, in all the religions of the world, we have a lower world as a black pit into which Yama, the lord of the underworld, hurls the souls of the damned to suffer in hell of their own creation. For it is true that each race makes from its own nature the demons which torment it. Here, Typhon, the Egyptian god of destruction, with the body of a hog and the head of a crocodile, awaits with yawning jaws to devour those who have failed to make proper use of life's opportunities. Among most peoples, the demon is symbolized as part animal, part human. He dwells in the animal nature of man and those who are controlled by their appetites. Their likes and dislikes, their hates and fears, need no further damnation. They have built their own hell and are experiencing its torments. The generative system is gradually being absorbed into the brain, and the man of the next great world period will generate its progenies, or at least the vehicles from them, through the larynx, which is the organ of the spoken word. We are told that a small etheric body, which will later be the organ of positive reproduction, is gradually being built near the larynx. Ultimately, human beings will become capable of raising the spinal fire through the Shashumna Canal. This is an evolutionary process, however, covering a long period of time. The physical body is supposed to be under the control of the moon, which ruled the liquids of the earth. The moon was the last incarnation of the earth spirit, and the human race passed through its state of animal consciousness into the etheric body of the moon. The lunar spirits are called the ancestors and are known to Christians as angels. These beings have controlled the generative powers of animal and man. The life coming into incarnation often chooses its figure vehicles many years before it appears in the world. It is said that the etheric germ is placed in the body of the parent as long as 20 years before the child comes into the world. This is the result of its search for an environment especially suited to its spiritual and maternal needs. 
Certain occult schools have taught that the spiritual consciousness of mankind was not fixed in any part of the body, but was in whatever part his thoughts dwelt. There are three worlds where mankind may dwell. The first is the mental world, where they may live surrounded by thoughts, their dreams, their inspirations. The second is the human world, where they may be one of the great middle class, which thinks a little, eats a little, sleeps a little, and worries unceasingly. The third is the animal world, where they may dwell in the midst of passions, lusts, and hates, which burn their soul and consume their body. The history of primitive races shows that they have risen through all of these stages until the last few have become truly thinking creatures. The blood of every woman and man is individual. When crystallizing, it forms into geometric patterns which differ with every person. So by the means of blood analysis, a far surer system could be evolved for crime detection than either the Bertillian or fingerprint systems. The story of mankind's soul is written in their blood. The position they occupy in evolution, their scopes, their fears, are all imprinted on the etheric forms which flow through the bloodstream. Until red blood came into the body, the spirit of mankind could not enter, but hovered over the body, attached to it by an electric thread. By studying crickets, grasshoppers, and similar small creatures clairvoyantly, it is possible to observe slight energy impulses hovering over their bodies, which result in the primitive motion and sense which they demonstrate. Therefore, it is said that an actual line between the vegetable and the animal is drawn with the coming of red blood. Consequently, certain small fishes, mollusks, etc. are technically vegetables, although not recognized such by science. The liver is the key to red blood. Lucifer's red garments derive their color from the blood, while the word Lucifer means a carrier of light, or heat, and is named for the blood. For this reason, he is the spirit of temptation. In the Christian mysteries, the piercing of the liver of Christ by the spear of the centurion is especially mystical, while Prometheus, the friend of man, hanging upon the peak of Mount Caucasus with the vulture gnawing at his liver, is the same myth expressed in the symbolism of ancient Greece. It is further interesting to note the relation between the words live and liver, for to have liver is to live. Along the same line, we may note that the word live spelled backward becomes evil, and the word lived becomes devil. This particular relationship is found not only in English, but to a slightly less noticeable degree in several languages. When we take this up, we become involved in the study of Kabbalism, which is the analysis of the symbolic meaning of words. Red is the color of blood and the key of the liver, and its effects upon animals is very noticeable. It irritates, excites, and in some cases actually causes animals to go mad. Therefore, it is often used in making the capes worn during bullfights. These the fighters flaunt in the bull's face, and trouble usually follows. The use of red lights is not uncommon in black magic. Sorcerers use them to materialize specters, while medical science has discovered that red light is a strong irritant when applied to the human body. During anger and hate, the astral aura of man becomes streaked with red flames, very closely resembling thunderbolts. Very often the base of the spine glows with a murky red light, symbolic of hate, passion, or anger. This red glow, burning eternally at the base of the spine, has given rise to the story of hellfire and damnation. But the preacher has failed to remind the laity that they carry their own hell around with them wherever they go. The red power is said to be broken from white light of the sun through the body of Samuel, the spirit of Mars. This is the cause of the red glow in the heavens. Mars is the god of war, wrangling, hate, and dissension. He was the patron deity of the Roman Empire, whose uniformed soldiers wore red as the symbol of his sway. Following the lead of this patron saint, they conquered the world and then fell upon the swords with which they had murdered others. While red is the color of the body, Yellow is regarded as the color of the soul. For this reason, the Buddhas and world saviors are usually symbolized as being surrounded by a golden nimbus or halo. This is the light of the yellow robe, also the light of bearing witness to the darkness of which St. John wrote. This light, flooding through the third ventricle, represents the Shekinah of the Jews, which hovers over the mercy seat as a pact between God and man. Yellow is a vitalizer, a life giver. Therefore, the golden-haired sun and its personification, the Christ, 
are both givers of light. Devitalization may be successfully treated by exposing the spleen to sunlight. Blue, the highest of the three primary colors, is the color given to the father. It is the relaxing, restful color, especially valuable in the treatment of insanity and obsession. It is difficult for black magicians to function successfully in blue light. Its affinity to the mind is very evident, and it gathers an electric C in the pineal gland as an extract from all the spiritual qualities of human nature. The blue heart to every flame was said to symbolize the invisible Father behind the glowing sun. In the words of Christ, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. I am the Father, and the Father in me. The use of colors in symbolism is very interesting. The green dragon, whom the heroes of mythology usually slay, represents the earth. The white armor is a purified physical body. The black magician is darkness and uncertainty. All colors have symbolic value, and great lessons can be learned from the study of the application of these values to occultism. While discussing the subject of occult anatomy and physiology, we must stop for a moment and give credit to the alchemists and Rosicrucians, who during the Middle Ages concealed the study of occult anatomy by dressing up the organs of the human body in the form of retorts and alchemical vessels. One of their great exponents said in substance, Our chemistry is not with chemicals as you know them, but with the certain secret vessels, internal organs, and spiritual chemicals which are invisible to the ordinary individual. We do not believe in torturing chemicals, combining them to form gases, vapors, or seething masses. For chemicals, like men, can suffer when brought into unkind relationship with each other. The alchemical furnace was the human body. The fire that burned it was at the base of the spine. The chimney was the spinal cord up which the vapors passed to be gathered again and distilled in the brain. This was indeed a secret system brought to Europe from the Far East, where for centuries it had been considered the highest form of spiritual practice. We may call these occult truths the principles of the operative spirituality in contradistinction to the modern religion, which is made entirely of speculative theories. People do not dream that religion is psychological, nor would they believe that their salvation depends entirely on scientific uses of the life elements and forces within their own bodies. But in spite of all that may be said during the contrary, such is the case. During the continued years, much will be done to the enlightened man concerning the secret workings of his own parts and members. It is very interesting to note the similitude existing between the incarnations and appearances in the world of the great avatar, Vishnu, and the changes which take place in the human embryo previous to birth. This brings us to our next subject, occult embryology. The great Lord Vishnu has already come nine times into the world to save his people. His tenth birth is yet to come. His nine appearances closely parallel the nine principal changes taking place in the human embryo previous to birth. Vishnu was the first born out of the mouth of a fish. He then rose out of the body of a turtle. Still later he appeared as a boar, then a lion, afterwards a monkey. And after a number of still other changes he appeared as a man. A scientist once arranged a table showing the relationship of the human brain to the various animals during the prenatal period. They followed exactly the list of incarnations of Vishnu, while totally unaware that they were linking together Oriental occultism and Occidental embryology. The cosmogony myths of nearly every nation are based upon embryology. The formation of the cosmos is said to have taken place in the same way that man is formed, only on a larger scale. In the Vishnu Puranas, we are told that the creation took place within the womb of men. Space was surrounded by great mountains and cliffs. The universe was created out of the water and flowed out of the great sea, the amniotic fluid. Down a ladder, the umbilical cord, came the gods. Four rivers flowed into the new land, as told in Genesis. These are the blood vessels of the umbilical cord, so the story goes, and a marvelous correlation exists. Someday perhaps a new science may be based upon the law of analogy. This will prove to be a far greater contribution to the scientific data than all scientific speculations of all ages. It is reasonably certain that the story of Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden is based upon embryology, and that the womb is the original Garden of Eden. 
In symbolism, it is represented by a dot in a circle. This dot is the primitive germ, and so on, as far as you wish to carry the analogy. The egg of Brahma is the story of the cosmic embryo, and embryology is based on the study of creation. In embryology, we also have a very interesting recapitulation of the passage of the human race through the various species of nature. Here we find, at certain periods of the Hyperborean creatures, at another time we see the primitive Lemurian man, later the Atlantean, and finally the Aran. It is recommended of all occult students that they make very careful study of this subject. Science knows that all life upon this planet comes out of the water. The human embryo is enveloped in the water through all the primitive stages of its growth, and in it we find the story of the evolution of all things. Sex did not appear upon the planet until the third race. It does not appear in the embryo until the third month. The recapitulation of the human embryo through the lower kingdoms of nature is one of the strongest proofs of evolution. Inasmuch as it proves conclusively that men could not have been made originally in his adult condition, Consequently, they pass through a cosmic embryology. In fact, they are still in an embryo and will not actually be born in the human race until they are truly human, which will not be for thousands of years. They are just in a state of becoming mankind. The nine months of paternal epoch has been employed in symbolism for ages. Nine is called the number of man because of the nine months that the body is in a state of preparation. The perfect number is supposed to be 12, so at the present time, man is born three months before he is finished. The gradual unfoldment of the human race will result in more being accomplished during the parental epoch, until finally birth will be the ultimate and all experience and growth will take place in the embryonic state. Mankind is not born all at once. We may say that they are born by degree. The consciousness works outside the body, laboring with the plastic substance up until the time of the quickening, when it takes hold of the vehicle from within and begins to mold a certain amount of individuality out of the materials which surround it. At the time of birth, the physical body is born, and a process of crystallization sets in which never ceases for a moment until death. Mankind begins to die the moment they are born, and the span of life is the length of time which this requires. At the seventh year, the vital body comes into action, and the greatest periods of growth commence. Children shoot up like weeds, for they are literally recapitulating their plant existences, whereas before that time, they were recapitulating their mineral state. At about the seventh year, the child begins to manufacture vital essences within their own body. Up to that time, they live upon the life forces secreted in the ductless glands of the throat before birth. In other words, they maintain themselves upon life which has been stored away from the parent. At about seven, they start to work for themselves. They are on the go every minute, and if youth could only bottle up the energy and preserve it for old age, what a wonderful world we would live in. Between 12 and 14 in the temperate zones of the liver starts activity. The emotional body is born. It is during these adolescent years that youth faces its greatest problem, Emotionalism runs riot. The consciousness is recapitulating its animal existence. It may truly be said that these are the days of puppy love. These are years often filled with great mistakes. More lives are blighted between the 14th and 25th years than any other period in life. It has been observed that the children of strongly emotional races are oftentimes brilliant and at the head of their classes until adolescence. When, however, the emotional nature becomes active at about the 14th year, these children frequently lose interest and ability in formal education. Any school teacher who has taught foreign children will vouch for this condition among certain nationalities. Coming of age is an example of the loss of mental function with the birth of the astral body, and there are many examples. During these years of emotional riot, parents must rule their children with firmness and kindness, or those same children will turn some day upon their parents and blame them for ruined lives. Between 18 and 21, according to climatic conditions, the mental body takes hold, and we can say the individual has reached the age of maturity. They are then permitted to vote. Their father presents them with a gold watch and sends them out into the world to seek their fortune. 
Not one person in a million realizes why 21 is said to be the age of maturity, but every occultist knows the reason. The spiritual consciousness, the true I am, does not take hold of its new body until the 21st year. Up to that time, it's ruled entirely by the lower sense centers. Life thus progresses in cycles of seven years. As an example of this, we know that the 28th year is the period of the second physical birth. The 35th year is the period of the second vital birth, or, as it is called, the second growth. The 42nd year is the period of second emotional birth. During these years, people otherwise perfectly normal very often grow sentimental. The 49th year marks the dawn of the new period of mental activity, and the following seven years are the golden years of thought. They are the periods of philosophic reason, and typically the crowning years of life, and so on, cycle after cycle. If the individual waits long enough, he may pass through his second, third, and fourth childhoods. Few people realize that they are composed of mineral, plant, and animal elements. The bones are literally minerals. The hair is a plant nourished by waves of vital ether pouring out through the skin, while within every individual are thousands of little wiggling, creeping, crawling things that make each of us a zoo all by ourselves. The ancient Scandinavians realized this, wrote many legends about the little creatures that live in man. A famous statue of Father Nile shows him covered over with tiny human figures representing the attributes and the functions of man. Mankind is a great study, but we make very little use of our textbook. The scriptures of all nations are filled with astronomical references to the cities and places that have no existence outside of mankind themselves. The twelve gates of the holy city are the twelve apertures of the human body. Like the twelve masters of wisdom and the twelve great schools of philosophy, these apertures are divided into two divisions of seven and five. For there are seven visible openings and five concealed openings in the human body. One of the Greek philosophers told his disciples to remember distinctly that there were six openings leading into the human brain, but only one leading out of the human head, and that one led from the stomach. Therefore, they were to listen twice, once with each ear, look twice, once with each eye, sense twice, once with each nostril, but to speak only once, and that what they spoke would come from the stomach and the brain. The advice still holds good. The Hebrews used the human head as a favorite symbol to express the divine attributes, calling it the great face. The two eyes were correlated to the Father, for they were organs of consciousness. The two nostrils to the Son, because they were organs of sense and also vehicles for prana, the life force in the ether. The mouth was used to symbolize the Holy Spirit, the one from whom set forth the spoken word and formed the world. The seven vowels to which the mouth gave birth were the seven spirits before the throne, also the vials and trumpets of revelation. They went forth as an army of voice to create in the seven worlds, and all nature resulted in their creative power. Very few realized the magnificent symbolism concealed within the human head, and even fewer realized how it has been used in scriptural writings. Part 6 Occult Masonry To the student of mystic masonry, one problem eternally presents itself. They know it under many names. It is told to them in many symbols. But briefly, it may be defined as the purification and liberation of spirit and body from the bane of materiality. In other words, they are seeking to rescue the life buried amongst the ruins of the fallen temple and restore it to its rightful place in the keynote of the spiritual arch. When studying ancient masonry, we are dealing with one of the first revelations of what we know as the wisdom teachings. Like other great mysteries, it consists of solutions to problems of everyday existence. It may seem of little use to us now to study these ancient abstract symbols, but in time every student will realize that these things they cast aside now as worthless are jewels which they one day will need. Like the centaur in the zodiac, man is eternally striving to lift his human consciousness from the body of the animal. And in the three-runged ladder of masonry, we find the three great steps which are necessary for this liberation. These three steps are the three grand divisions of human consciousness. We can briefly define them as materiality, 
intellectuality, and spirituality. They also represent action on the lowest rung, emotion on the central, and mentality on the highest. All human beings are lifting themselves up to the divine by climbing these three steps that lead to liberation. When we have united these three manifestations into a harmonious balance, we then have the flaming triangle. The ancients declared God as the dot in the circle to be unknowable, but said that he manifested through his three witnesses, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now the same is true with mankind. The part of God, which is within each of us, can manifest only through his three witnesses. The Father manifests through our thoughts, the Son through our emotions, and the Holy Spirit through our actions. When we balance our thoughts, our desires, and our actions, we have an equilateral triangle. When man's purified life energies radiate through these three witnesses, we have a halo of flame added to the triangle, in the center of which is God the unknowable and unthinkable one, the yod or flaming letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the abyss which one cannot understand but from which all things come. The life of this unknown pours outward through the triangle, which in the higher degrees is surrounded by a halo of flame. The halo is the soul built from the transmuted thought, action, and desire, the eternal triangle of the divine. Among Masonic symbols is the beehive, called the symbol of industry, for it clearly demonstrates how man should cooperate with his fellow men for the mutual development of all. It also contains a much deeper message, for each living soul is a bee that travels through the life and gathers the pollen of wisdom from the environments and experiences of life. As the bee gathers the honey from the heart of the flower, so each of us should extract the spiritual nectar from each happening, each joy, and each sorrow and incorporate it into the great beehive of experience, the soul body of man. In the same way, it is said that the spiritual energies of mankind eternally take the life force they are transmuting and carry them up to the beehive in the brain, where is kept the honey or oil necessary for the sustenance of life. The ancient gods are said to have lived on nectar and not to have eaten or drunk like other women or men. It is quite true that honey gained or extracted from coping with the problems of everyday life is the food of the higher man. While we eat at the well-laden board, it would be well for us to consider whether or not the spiritual person is also nourished and developed by the things which they have transmuted in their own lives. An ancient philosopher once said that the bee extracts honey from the pollen of the flower, while from the same source the spider extracts poison. The problem which then confronts us is, are we bees or spiders? Do we transform the experiences of life into honey, or do we change them into poison? Do they lift us, or do they eternally rebel against us? Those who do not know become soured by experience. But the wise ones take the honey and build it into the beehive of their own spiritual nature. It is well for us to also consider the grip of the lion's paw, one of the world's oldest symbols of initiation. In ancient times, the neophyte, on the way through the mysteries of Egypt's temples, was finally buried in a great stone coffer for the dead, later to be raised to life again by the master initiate in his robes of blue and gold. When the candidate was thus raised, the grand master wore upon his arm the hand of a paw of a lion as a glove, and it was said to the newly raised disciple that they had been brought to life by the grip of the lion's paw. The Hebrew letter Yod which is used in the center of the triangle and is sometimes used as the symbol of spirit because of its flame-like appearance, means, according to the Kabbalist, a hand that is stretched forth. We understand this to symbolize the sun spirit in man, which is said to be enthroned as the sign of Leo, the lion of Judah. And as the fruits of the fields of the seedlings are grown and developed through the sun's rays, so it is said that the crystallization of mankind is broken up and dispelled by the light of the spiritual sun which raises the dead with its powers and liberates the latencies of life. The spirit of mankind, with its eyes that see in the dark, is ever striving to lift the lower side of their own nature to union with themselves. When the lower man is thus raised from materiality by the higher ideals which unfold within their own being, it is said that the spirit of light and truth 
has raised the candidate for initiation by the grip of the lion's paw. Consider the symbols of the two Johns as we find them in the Masonic rituals. John means ram, and the ram is symbolic of the animal passions and propensities of men. In John the Baptist, dressed in the skins of animals, these passions are untransmuted, while in John the Evangelist, they have been transmuted until the vehicles and powers which they represent have become the beloved disciples of the Christ life in man. We may hear the expression riding the goat or climbing the greased pole. This is often symbolic import to those who have eyes to see, for when mankind masters their own lower animal nature, they can honestly say that they are riding the goat, and if he cannot ride the goat, he cannot enter the temple of initiation. The greased pole which they must climb refers undoubtedly to the spinal column, and it is only when the consciousness of mankind climbs up this column into the brain that they can take the degrees of Freemasonry. The subject of the lost word should be considered as an individual problem. Mankind themselves, that is, dire true principle, may be called the lost word, but it is better to say that it is a certain something radiating from them which constitutes a password recognized by all members of the craft. When mankind, as the architect of their temple, abuses and destroys the life energies within themselves, then the builder, after having been murdered by the lower three bodies, carries with them the tomb where they lay the word which is the proof of the position. Abuse of mental, physical, or spiritual powers results in the murder of energy. And when this energy is lost, mankind loses with it a sacred word. Our lives, our thoughts, desires, and actions are the living threefold password by which a master builder knows their kin. And when the student seeks admittance to the inner room, they must present at the temple gates the credentials of a purified body and a balanced mind. No price can buy this sacred word. No degree can bestow it. But when within ourselves our otherwise dead builder is then raised to life once more, they themselves speak the word, and upon the philosopher's stone, built within themselves, is engraved the living name of the divine. It is only when this builder is raised that the symbols of mortality can be changed into those of immortality. Our lives are the broken pillars, crystallization is the coffin, and disintegration is the open grave. But above all is the sprig of evergreen, promising life to those who raise the serpent power, and showing that under the debris of the temple is buried the body of the builder, who is raised when we liberate the divine life which is locked within our material natures. There are many of these wonderful Masonic symbols handed down to us from the forgotten past, symbol whose meanings long lost have been buried beneath the mantle of materiality. The true Mason, the child of the light, still cries out for liberation, and the empty throne of Egypt still waits for the king of the sun who was killed. All the world still waits for the bold and the beautiful to come and live again, for the crucified Christ to roll away of stone and rise from the tomb of matter, bringing his own tomb with him. When mankind has so lived that they can understand this wonderful problem, the great eye or center of consciousness is enabled to see out through the clean glass of the purified body. The mysteries of true masonry, long concealed from the profane, are then understood, and the new master, donning his robes of blue and gold, follows in the footsteps of the immortals who are climbing, step by step, the ladder leading upward to the seven stars. Far above, the ark, the source of life, floats over the waters of oblivion on high and sends its messages down to the lower man through the cable tow. When this point is reached, the door in the G is closed forever, for the dot has returned to the circle, and the threefold spirit of the threefold body are linked together in the eternal seal of Solomon. Then does the cornerstone, which the builder rejected, become again the head of the corner, and man, the capstone long missing from the universal temple, is again in place. The daily occurrences of our lives are sharpening our senses and developing our faculties. These are the tools of the craft, the mallet, the chisel, and the rule. And with these self-developed tools, we are slowly turning the rough asher or cube into a finished block of universal temple. It is only then that we become initiates of the flame, for only then does light 
take the place of darkness. As we wander through the vaulted chambers of our own being, we learn the meaning of vaulted chambers of the temple. And as the initiatory ritual unfolds before our eyes, we should recognize in it the recapitulation of our own being, the unfoldment of our own consciousness, and the story of our own lives. With this thought in mind, we are able to understand not only why the Atlanteans of old worshipped the rising sun, but also how the modern individual symbolizes the sun as the highborn, who, when he rises to the top of the temple, places the golden stone upon it and raises to life all things in man.